All right. Hey guys, I'm I'm David Erlocker. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. Hopefully my voice will hold up through this. Um, so I work for Luxor, been there since May 2022. So coming up on two years, I joined the firmware team at the time. It was full-time two other engineers. So I was the third. Our core team is like pretty much four, but we get a lot of support uh, from a few other engineers, maybe five on the core team. You know, there's a lot of people that kind of multitask across product lines, but I'm pretty much full-time firmware dev for that whole time. Uh, Lux OS, uh, you know, is our firmware. I'll talk a lot about that. Um, I guess just to give you a little bit more of my background, I moved to Denver. So I am based in Denver. I uh, moved here in 2010. Dan and I are the only two current Denver employees of Luxor. We're all over the world. Um, I think every continent, maybe. Um, I don't know how, yeah, I don't know. Tons of countries, it's really cool. Um, about 50 to 60 employees. Um, but yeah, based in Seattle, as it says here. Uh, so my background, I moved here uh, as an electrical engineer in the aerospace industry. So that was my whole career. I'm an electrical engineer by profession, more of a computer engineer by trade, uh, and just what I ended up working on over all those years, um, and then got into to Bitcoin as a career path uh, back with Luxor in 2022, but was working uh, or like doing hobbyist dabbling in Bitcoin well before that. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna just have a quick overview. I know that the diversity of knowledge in this room is really wide, so there's gonna be some things I probably go over that will bore you, but other people will be like, wow, this is, I've never heard of any of this. Uh, we're gonna talk about the electrical architecture of Bitcoin ASIC mining hardware. So we do have a Bitcoin ASIC over here. Uh, the term ASIC, I'll get into this a little more, is uh, referring to a circuit chip, an application-specific integrated circuit. So it's kind of annoying to me that we call them Bitcoin ASICs, but it's because they're an ASIC-based architecture. But yeah, I see some, some people cheering that on because you probably can relate, and then other people don't care or can't relate, which is fine. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, it's the chips that are doing the magic, that, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too, um, that are the ASICs, and it's an ASIC-based machine, but it's a Bitcoin miner. Um, and there is one running over here. I'm going to do a Lux OS demo. I wasn't sure how the screen would be tonight. Uh, hopefully, it'll show up OK, and we'll be able to get through that. Uh, but yeah, we are going to talk about firmware kind of in general, um, and then a little bit detail into Lux OS specifically. I'll do the firmware demo. Hopefully, we have time to talk about Bitcoin mining at home. Obviously, that miner running over there, you can use at home. It's running off of a 120-volt circuit. It's way underclocked right around 1,000 watts right now. I um, mean, it's basically a space heater that mines Bitcoin. I um, mean, it's very quiet. So we'll talk a lot about the considerations for mining at home and what you might need if you're interested in dabbling in that. Um, and then we'll have time at the end, hopefully, for lots of questions. So yeah, this overview, just real quick, I wanted to kind of walk you through the evolution of the mining hardware. Uh, so you can see, I put rough dates. I'm not an expert on this. Most of this is just pulled off the internet really fast, so there's probably some people that could critique some of this. Uh, but you've got from the S9 gen, and I, I show you kind of the terahash uh, for these models, all the way up through the latest and greatest S21s that are coming out now. Um, and they're, you can see, just like Dan talked about that, kind of growth just last year in hash rate, you can see how the hash rate of just a single miner has gone exponential over time, just over that short uh, time frame. So the, the S19s, that generation has kind of been going on for a long time, and I kind of broke it out to some of the popular miners. But all these are made by Bitmain. They're a big Chinese company. They make the hardware. Luxor didn't make the hardware, but we're leveraging it and putting our firmware on there. And we'll talk more about that uh, when we get to it. Uh, but even within S19, you've seen this evolution of 95 terahash up to about 141 terahash for the XPs, you know, growth of roughly 50% hash rate just over that period of time. All right, so talking about the electrical architecture, I just wanted to kind of get a little bit nerdy and, and just talk about what, what are these things. Like this thing's mining Bitcoin. What constructs it? What's it all about? So I've got a picture here. You can see some ribbon cables. You can see the control board. I've got some control boards up here. 
Uh, not too worried. I think this one's actually maybe dead. Not too worried about passing them around. Uh, so I'll probably pass this one around as I'm talking about these. Um, but you know, there's a control board, and this is where the firmware goes. This is like your, your CPU. There is a CPU chip on these. Uh, there's different types. I'll get into details on that. I've got three of the four main types up here. Um, so yeah, I'll pass this one around. This is a beagle bone. This is like the worst of the control boards. <laughs> so yeah. I do want that back at the end. So if it can just like end up by the shirts or something, I don't care. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the top view. I'll, I'll get into this and break it down. But keep that picture in your mind. So I took that picture, made a block diagram. Engineers like block diagrams. Um, so here on the left, you can see the power supply. So those. The S19 series, Bitmain went to 240 volt only, and there's electrical reasons for that. We don't have time to get into all that. That kind of like pushed out some of the home miners that were running S9s, because S9s could run from 120 or 240. You guys know, it, in the USA, a 240 volt circuit, that's dedicated to things like air conditioners, ovens, dryers, dedicated outlets. Your wife's gonna kill you if you unplug the dryer and plug in your miner. It's gonna be super loud. These things are ridiculous. They're just noisy. This is not a good representation because it's running so quietly over here, just hashing away, making a little heat in the corner. Um, and then for Bitcoin miners, there are other types of miners that have different hash board counts. But for Bitcoin miners, Bitmain's always had three hash boards in there. So the hash boards all have some pictures. So um, but they're just like mounted vertically and they're all the same thing. And that's where the ASIC chips live. So you guys can see uh, right here, each of these hash boards has ASIC chips. And depending on the model, we'll determine how many chips are on there. Over time, the chips have evolved too. There's a lot that goes into making these chips. And in that short period of time, roughly 2016 to today, um, those pr the process node, so the transistor size, has decreased a lot, which has caused the efficiency to go up, uh, which has made them way more powerful, which is how we get from hash rates of 14 up to 200 terahash now. Um, so the control board has interfaces to the hash boards. They get power from the power supply. Control board gets power from the power supply. So that power supply takes your AC and converts it to DC. Control board gets 12 volts. The voltage is variable to the hash boards, roughly 12 to 15 volts. There are 14 to 17 volt DC power supplies out there as well. Um, each of these hash boards connect to the control board through, a, through that ribbon cable I was talking about and these hash board connectors. Here's a ribbon cable here. Um, and so this ribbon cable carries a whole bunch of signals, but the main ones are the serial interface. So that talks to the ASIC chips. There's an the I2C interface. that. It depends on the machine, but that talks to either PICs or temp sensors. And there's discrete signals that tells the control board if there's a hash board there. Basically, uh, hello world, I'm plugged in. Um, and then there's a, like a reset, things like that. A discrete means it's either 0 or 1, it's on or off. So the control board has a CPU on it. Each of these different types has a different processor. Uh, I'll get more into detail in that later. Some of them have an SD card. They have a user and a reset button. The user button is usually you push it, and it'll tell you. It'll broadcast like your IP address, and you can find it on your network. There's an Ethernet interface. That's obviously how it talks to the pool. So there's communication going back and forth from the, the pool to the miner and vice versa. It's over the stratum protocol. Um, and then, of course, the fans, so the control board sends power to the fans. There's a PWM signal. That stands for pulse width modulation. That controls how fast the fans uh, spin. There's a sense line that comes back. It's a sensor to determine, is the fan really spinning? And is it spinning the speed I expect it to? Um, and that can help you debug if there's a bad fan or a broken wire or anything like that. Um, there's also memory on the board. SD RAM is, is DDR memory, just like in your computer. NAND flash is non-volatile. That means when it powers off, it sticks around. That's where firmware is normally installed if it's not installed on the SD card. All right, that slide took a while, but that was like a lot of information. Um, I do want this to be a little bit interactive. So if you have like an urgent question on a slide as I go, feel free to raise your hand, but otherwise we'll keep moving. So oh, go ahead. Control board is 
in some kind of Linux computer. Yeah, yeah, you can think of it that way. Um, it's it's got a processor, so whatever OS is supported on here. Like, so it's something similar to it's sim it's similar to that, yeah. And I'll so get is it Linux or it's not Linux? Yes, Linux. Okay. Yeah, it, it could be something else though. But yeah. And uh, it uses this uh, hash board boards as, for example, like uh, specialized uh, CPU, like GPU we have. Yep, the ASIC chips are like a GPU. They're they're just computing hash functions, and I'll talk about that a little bit more too. So, yeah. So left to right in that diagram, I had the power supply, the hash boards, uh, the control board. I'm gonna talk in more detail about each of them. So here's some pictures of the inside of a power supply, uh, the lower right. The upper right, you can see the bus bars uh, connecting from the power supply to the hash boards. So at maximum rated power, which you can actually exceed that, <laughs> uh, it's, it's 200 amps. So 200 amps of DC current going through these. These are just huge, heavy bus bars. I'll pass one of them around. They can end up in the same spot as the control board. Uh, but all the power to the hash boards goes through there. These things draw roughly 3,000 to 4,000 watts, depending on how you have it configured. Out of the box, most of them are in that like 3,500 watt range, which is a ton of power. Um, the normal max amount of power you want to plug into a normal outlet is about 1,200 watts. Um, of course, these are running from 240 volt circuits as well. Um, but yeah, and then I show some of the, so just like the miners have evolved over time, the power supplies have too, because they have to keep up with, uh, you know, supplying that amount of power. Obviously, the S9 generation only needed to supply about 1,400 watts nominally, and that's what I'm actually using to power that S19 over there. And if we have time, uh, we're going to talk about how to do that at the end. I, I'm sure we'll have time. We'll be good. Um, all right. So control boards, I really liked this post. There's a few memes that have gone around. Uh, this one kind of tries to categorize these control boards. We had BeagleBone, the sandwich. I mean, that's just its nature of being like this daughter board that plugs into the I.O. board. Horrible design. Uh, but made it nice for reverse engineering, like where all the I.O. pins went. That was kind of cool. Um, we had Amlogic, the menace. Uh, that We nicknamed it that. And this was Altair Tech, but I think Luxor had a little bit uh, involved in this too. Um, but early on, it doesn't have an SD card, so it was really hard to get firmware to work on it. So I was kind of menacing. Xilinx, the GOAT, uh, there's a reason behind that. But Xilinx is the, kind of the OG chipset on these control boards. S9s all use the Xilinx uh, chip, actually a bigger one than the S19s use, ironically. Um, and then the CV1835 that we call the imposter, that's the new board on the market. Uh, came out I don't know, mid last year, as far as I know, maybe springtime last year. Um, and there, there's a few. I guess I'll walk through these. So Xilinx, that's my favorite. It's got an embedded zinc processor, but it's an FPGA. So an FPGA is like an ASIC architecture, but reprogrammable. I'm going to talk more about that, because my whole background and my whole career is in FPGAs. Uh, and that was kind of my foot in the door with Luxor. They needed a firmware engineer with that expertise. Um, of course, Xilinx has the SD card. Um, and the older gen models actually require a Xilinx control board. If you try to swap out to a newer one, it's not going to work. That's the power of the FPGA. It's doing some extra processing that those old miners needed that the newer miners offloaded into the ASIC chips. And they were able to come out with these newer, probably more affordable control boards. Um, yeah, so BeagleBone, those really came out with the S19J Pro Wave. Uh, as far as I know, Bitmain's not shipping with them anymore. They're a pretty crummy control board. Uh, don't recommend. It's got a TI processor on it. Um, of course, the Xilinx one has a Xilinx Zinc. Uh, Xilinx got acquired by AMD, um, so pretty well known now. Amlogic is, a, I think, a company out of San Francisco. Their chips were used in like TVs, cameras, video processing type applications. No SD card. Um, but it's a quad-core processor, um, and all the latest machines ship with them, even S21, T21, um, and then CVI Tech. Uh, oddly enough, I, I thought Bitmain was going to start shipping everything with this control board, uh, but from my perspective, it's been more sparse than expected. I, I'm not sure why. 
Um, they're more secure, so there is some third-party firmware that can run on them, but they need like a special process, like a software process running, because when it reboots, it loses its brains and you have to reconfigure it. Um, so Luxor, you know, eventually we hope to support this control board. That's uh, something we're working on. Dude, what, what was the reason for changing these control boards? Is it just the fact that it cost? I, I think cost, mm -hmm. supply chain, yeah, Bitmain loves to like just mix things up from what I've seen and they love having tons of hardware configurations to manage, I'm not sure why. Um, er, early in my career, I had to deal with different configurations on a small scale and it was like the worst. So I, I don't even know what they're thinking by doing that. But I think cost was a big driver. Uh, BeagleBone is a commercially available dev board, you can buy one. So that the way that's the sandwich and it has that little board, you can buy that little board. And so they basically, I think, kind of took something that was easy to copy and then they made the IO board that it plugs into and hooked it up. But then later, I think they found out this board kind of stinks and it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty bad. It, if you look at uh, performance comparisons across control boards, it's far inferior to the others, so. Will having an inferior control board impact the hash rate, or how does that affect the mining? No, it, if it's if it's paired with the with firmware on a machine that it's good with, it's no issue. It's not going to affect anything. You might notice like, oh, the GUI seems kind of slow right now. Why is that? Well, it's because the CPU is overloaded. Um, if you try to use one with a new gen machine. Depending on the firmware, the configuration, uh, if you're overclocking, it might not be able to keep up and can kind of make it go off the rails. So uh, don't, you know, if, if on our website we say BeagleBone is beta, that probably means you could run into some scenarios where it's not going to be a good fit. Um, if we say it's compatible, then you're going to be okay. So good questions. Um, yeah, I think that's all on that page. Let's take a closer look at the, the Xilinx control board is the one I wanted to kind of dig into a little more. Um, so in the picture here, and, and with this control board I'm holding, you can see all kinds of stuff on here, right? Like all the components. It's got the chip there um, in the middle. This is the actual Xilinx Zinc processor, FPGA. Um, it's got the flash memory here, the non-volatile. That's where the firmware is stored if you do a remote install. Otherwise, it's got the SD card here. You can always run third-party firmware like LuxOS that way. It's got the DDR memory, just like your home computer, this laptop I'm using. Um, it's got the Ethernet interface. And that miner over there, it's got a little Wi-Fi dongle, which is pretty sweet for home mining. I didn't have to deal with any cables. It's actually connected to my hotspot through my phone. I mean, it's, it's just craziness, right? Um, it's got the buttons and LEDs on the front panel here. Uh, the fan connectors over here. And then I had this picture because another thing, another hardware configuration example, uh, Bitmain started coming out with fans that are higher powered. It probably needed them for these newer machines. Um, so they started using these uh, two by two Molex connectors instead of the old style of connectors we've seen all these years since 2016 and before. All of a sudden, these started coming out with K-Pro, S19A, S21, T21, have control boards with all four of them. Um, interestingly, the control boards were always designed to handle those connectors. You can see the, the locations that are filled with solder on the boards. Um, so it, that was a good idea by them. The PCB design didn't have to change. It can go either way. But it's still like a configuration management thing to handle all these different configs of what kind of fan connectors do I need. Um, there's also the power supply connector. That's this uh, two by three connector here. It's got three 12 volt leads, three ground leads. It's got JTAG and serial for debug. JTAG actually communicates to that FPGA chip directly. Um, it even has an unused LCD interface. That's these six pins here. Um, early on when I was doing our FPGA bitstream development uh, to support Xilinx boards with LuxOS, I kind of wanted to play around with that because I have some LCD displays. I wanted to like throw some debug stuff out to a screen, but I just didn't have time. There's, it's like a fast moving environment. You just never have time to go back and 
play with stuff like that if it's not important for the, the end goal. I'd have to do it like at a hobby level with all the other electrical stuff I dabble with, but there's other stuff I'd rather be doing. Um, and then, of course, this board has all the normal electrical components, resistors everywhere, all these little small things, resistors, capacitors. I think these up here are maybe inductors. Uh, there's some diodes uh, right here. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, a lot to it. This is a computer, and it does run Linux, um, or versions of Linux, or it can run other OSs too. So, um, next slide. All right, the fun part, the hashboards. So yeah, this is where the magic happens, and you mentioned GPUs. So uh, an ASIC chip, an FPGA, they're a massive open parallel processor. You have uh, this array of digital logic and if you make a small design, like a hash core, you can take that small design and put it in and stamp it over and over and over and over and over and, and have all this parallel processing power. And that's exactly how these work. They have uh, hash cores in them that are performing the hash uh, algorithm. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, hopefully not in great detail. Um, but yeah, so this is that view of them being vertically mounted. You can see where those power bus bars are up here. Vertical mounted hash boards, and then you can see those heat sinks, that metal with the fins. Uh, that's designed as airflow comes through. It's gonna disperse all that heat. So if you walk over to this miner um, and fill on that right side of it, you'll feel all that heat coming out, and all that heat is going through those fins on those heat sinks. Um, and then I kind of put some notes up here uh, that all these machines have different chip counts. And the chips vary over time. We've seen, I can't remember, maybe five or six different major generations of chips over time. Um, this is a S19K Pro over here. It's got the same ASICs as the XPs, but much fewer per hash board. So there's only 77 per hash board compared to an XP with 110. Um, so it's actually, the K-Pro is ideal for this type of application where I can underclock it, run it very quietly at very low power because um, it's not super power hungry. So I can do that with all three boards. Uh, Tyler? Yeah, just back to the FPGAs quick. Was that purely an, a developmental tool, an intermediate step, or was there ever a period in time where it was the cutting edge miner? Yeah, so you're talking about mi instead of putting the design into ASICs, mining with FPGAs? Yeah, I've been trying to figure that out. Yeah, so that was early on. I'm actually going to talk about that a little okay. bit more, too. Um, but the answer, short answer is yes, FPGAs were used, but they were quickly outpaced by ASICs for a lot of reasons. Primary one being really two, uh, cost and efficiency. FPGAs cost more, they're way less efficient. Cool. Uh, so if you can put the same thing in an ASIC, then boom. But yeah, gotcha. but uh, FPJs are a good prototype platform too, so you could put that logic in an FPJ. And are still used and it, today. Yeah, and if you had the capital then to develop the ASIC from that, see, making an ASIC chip is a big feat. Right. It's, we can't do it, you need, you need a lot of money, you need, right. you need a lot of, you need a big team. Like, one person can't just go design an ASIC unless you're like super brilliant, Understood. and it's, it's crazy. Um, Ian, I think you had your hand next. Yeah, just trying to get the visual here. So, each of those black squares. Um, oh, yeah. On the right hand side is the, the side view of those. So, they're, they've just got anywhere from 126, you know, down to 77 vertically uh, stacked chips on top, and that's each of those black squares. Yeah, so this, this view, I, I should have been more clear about that. Each of these black uh, squares is an ASIC chip. So this is a hash board with that heat sink removed. Um, and the hash boards have different heat sink designs too. I think I have some pictures I can share with you. Um, so this is a close up of the chip. This is a top. This is a, the actual die package that's gonna have thermal grease, conductive thermal grease that pairs up with the heat sink to transmit that, like conduct that heat. This is the bottom side, so it's got these big pads uh, for power, and it's got all these pins on the sides. Um, so that's, that's all of its electrical interface, all that stuff that goes ultimately out to the ribbon cable and the control board. It's got a serial interface, uh, power, ground, discrete signals. I don't know what else is there. We don't have any data sheets for these. These are Chinese made. 
Um, there's no data sheet that says, here is the pinout. All of this stuff has been reverse engineered and figured out by people. Um, it, it's pretty crazy. Uh, but yeah, this is all the ASIC chips. You can see how they're spaced here. They get closer and closer together and farther apart. These close ones together are on the inlet side. The farther apart ones are on the outlet. So the idea is you're going to have the air is going to heat up as it goes through. So there's, there's really crazy mechanical engineering heat thermal considerations. If there's an ME in the room that knows about this stuff and wants to present, that would be a cool presentation. I mean, I, I can talk through some of this, but there's like way, it can go way beyond. Like designing a miner, a huge part of that is how in the world do we handle all this electricity that converts to heat and then dissipate it and deal with that. And that's why we see hydro miners, immersion mining, um, all these other ways to get rid of the heat besides super crazy loud fans that just annoy everybody, especially in your home. Yes? So I believe every of this chip requires data to process. So it requires some kind of throughput. How, how much throughput uh, can handle that controller and uh, how it works? Yeah, um, I didn't plan to get too much into the details of how it works, but the chips are basically getting work from the control board and then hashing on that work and then sending potential solutions back. So it really doesn't take a lot of bandwidth on that serial bus. It's just a serial port. It runs at, it varies by minor, but roughly three and an eighth megabod. Um, and it's not 100% utilized. So it does not require a lot of bandwidth. No, not a lot of bandwidth. and then. It, it really doesn't use a lot of internet connectivity to talk to the pool either. Every now and then it's just sending some potential, some shares, potential solutions back to the pool. So the, it's not a lot of bandwidth, but the chips, once they get the work, they're busy, 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 and then new work comes in. And sometimes they're probably not submitting potential hashes back even during that time they're working on it. It just doesn't get to a solution. Remember, we're talking every miner has anywhere from 150 plus upwards of 360 plus chips all working together at the same time. So, all right, let's keep moving. Here's another view. Yeah, so this, is, this slide I was kind of talking about the complex PCB layout and current considerations. How do I handle all this electrical power? And then the complex mechanical thermal considerations. So these are kind of the two main heat sink designs we see. We see these uh, like giant block heat sinks, contiguous heat sinks that conduct heat across all the chips. And it's on both sides. This is a picture of the other side. And they're like screwed down to get that mechanical pressure, get good contact. Um, and all, not all, but most of the newer gen machines have these kind of like block heat sinks. Um, and these aluminum backboards, which uh, be curious to talk to some of the miners out there and their thoughts on those, but they seem to get kind of a bad rap. Um, and then this is the older style. S9 Gen had this where the chips had individual heat sinks. And you can see they start out small and get bigger and bigger as we go this way. This is the hot side on the outlet. They need more, more metal, more heat dissipation because the air is hotter by the time it gets to them because it's heated up so much as it flows through that machine. Um, and yeah, this is the side that power connects to, the hashboard connector uh, connects right here. Um, yeah, that's about it there. I, I do need to keep moving. So talking about electrical architecture, these are digital systems. There's also analog stuff going on in the power supply, but my background is primarily digital. That's what I love, digital logic and computer engineering. So computer engineering, <laughs> is essentially you know, all this stuff going on with the ones and zeros. You know, how do we boil everything down to on and off, one and zero? Um, I, I put a couple pictures in here. This is a logic analyzer that I've got connected up to a machine. And this is before we designed our nice little snooper board. So this board can go in between the control board and the hash board. You need another ribbon cable. And then it runs all these pins out to here. And then I can hook them up to the logic analyzer. Uh, but this was before that, so I have all these like pins and stuff stuck in like a voodoo doll. And then this screen is all of those signals, and you can just see them going on and off and on and off and switching. I've got a, the serial bus here, 
um, the ITC bus, the ITC to the power supply. So there's actually a power supply interface I failed to mention as well, where there's communication from the control board to the PSU over ITC to set voltages, kind of check status, things like that. Um, so logic boils down to logic gates, which are built out of transistors, essentially. Um, and I, I just wanted to give you guys a little digital lesson because that's like the, the thing I've enjoyed the most um, throughout my career, kind of this aspect of digital logic and FPGA and ASIC design. Um, so there's inverters. If you put a one into an inverter, you get a zero out and vice versa. An AND gate, you guys have heard of like logic gates. I know a lot of you have, but for those who haven't, um, it's just basically math. It's, it's like a process, an AND gate. You can kind of assume what that's gonna do. It's only gonna turn on and give you a one if both inputs are one. If either input is zero, it's zero. If both inputs are zero, it's zero, because it's basically doing math. It's multiplying one times one, or one times zero, or zero times zero. The NAND gate just inverts that. So if you put a one, one in, get a one out, but then it's gonna invert, so you get a zero out. The only way you can get a zero out of an AND gate is put a one, one in. Everything else will come out as a one. And then there's OR gates. One, one, and it's on. On either pin, if both are one or both are zero, it's off. A NOR gate is the opposite of that. Then there's XOR, um, exclusive OR. Um, so only one input um, can be on. If both are, yeah, if both are on, then it's off. So, and then there's an XNOR. It just, those are like the basic building blocks of digital logic. Um, so I wanted to get into numbering too. You know, we all know base 10, right? Our number system, count to 10 and keep going 11, 12, 13, 14. Base two is the ones and zeros. The only two numbers you have to represent anything are one or zero. And then there's base 16 number systems. So computers love powers of two. And so base 16 is a power of two, two to the fourth. Um, there's also octal base eight, but so to, to do uh, 16 values, you can represent that with four bits because it's to the power of four. And those four bits are a power of two, but with octal, you have three bits, and that's not a power of two. So octal kind of, it just stinks. Nobody uses it anymore. Had a place back in the day, um, like early days. Maybe some people use it. I don't know. Um, yes? Uh, what is the voltage of zero and voltage of one? It depends on, on the system. So like on one of these control boards, it could be 3.3 volts. Could be five volts. It depends on the logic levels. So uh, zero, it's uh, zero volt. And uh, if it's a three volts, it will be three volts for one. Yep, theoretically, there's always a threshold too. Like it might be um, like 0.3 volts or less would come out as a zero, um, or like 4.7 or above would come out as a one. Everything else in between would be a X or indeterminate, uh, which could cause issues. But let's just think ideally, zero volts, five volts, or whatever your voltage level is. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so how would we convert 42 to binary? You do this recursive division by two, you get the remainders, and then you set them all up backwards. I'm trying to move fast here, but take my word on it, you get one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, okay? And we can use this binary notation. Okay, so we're gonna kind of walk through this really quick. I just love to introduce people to this or reintroduce it if you haven't seen this since high school math or something. Um, oops, sorry, I keep doing that. So how would we convert that 42 in binary back to decimal, you can multiply by the powers of two that represent those placeholders. So the least significant digit is two to the zero power, and then you get two to one to the two, and then you multiply them. If you have a one in that location, you do one times that power. If you have a zero there, you do zero times that power, so it's gonna become zero, and then you sum them up. So we end up with 32 plus eight plus two, which is 42. So I just proved Going both ways, okay, great. So hexadecimal, why do we need these 16 characters? Because we like powers of two. Um, so to actually represent it, we ran out of numbers, so we have to do this alphanumeric thing, and we use A through F. So I put this nice uh, key here, zero through F, and then the binary representation in four bits. Um, so we can break, we have notations too to kind of have names for groups of bits. Four bits is a nibble, eight bits is a byte. You can have a 16 
a bit system or a two byte or a 32 bit system, four bytes, right? Um, so now I'm going to show you how we convert 10, 10, 10 into hexadecimal. So 42, we can look up our, in our key. Um, and you can also just do the power of two math in your head if you're, if you're quick like that. Um, and then you just kind of remember you can zero, zero fill, zero lead uh, in front of that if you wanted to add in all four bits. Uh, but a one zero, that's a two. And the one zero, one zero, that's an A. So hex two A is 42, or binary one zero, one zero, one zero. Um, and then what about Bitcoin? So some of you are friends with me on Twitter. This is my Twitter handle. Bitcoin represented as a 32-bit or uh, four-byte hexadecimal value. And you can come up with all kinds of things. People, um, you'll see like people use hex codes for air codes. You'll see dead beef. I've used uh, in some of my aerospace stuff. I actually have two of my kids' names in flight on an Iridium satellite, uh, satellites, because um, I was able to represent their name as hex, and no, I didn't plan that when they were born. Um, my wife would have killed me. Um, but you know, you can make up words because we have letters, and you can some of the numbers represent letters too. Um, so it's easy to convert Bitcoin to hex if you have this code. Um, so that's it right there. Um, so it's kind of fun. And then there are only two types of people in the world: those who understand binary and those who don't. So now you guys understand binary, <laughs> hopefully. Um, how are we doing on time, Zach? Uh, about 10 minutes. 10 or? or... 10 minutes and then 10, 15 for questions, too. So. Oh, OK. I need to move faster. We, we can have less time for questions. If we yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Um, so FPJs versus ASICs. So this answers your question. Um, so they're developed kind of the same way at a design level. You use a hardware description language, VHDL, Verilog, or System Verilog. LuxOS's bitstream is mostly Verilog, but we have a little bit of VHDL in there too. Um, they're, they're both an array of digital logic. They require specialized tools to basically turn that design into the physical implementation of them. It goes through a synthesis process, which takes that code and converts it to logic, the gates that we talked about, and how to process all those ones and zeros. Um, it does the mapping, so where stuff's located. It does the routing, how you hook it up. Um, and then timing closure, and that's this idea of, will this work when I, when I run it at a certain frequency? And we're going to talk about frequency if we have time, too. Um, so FPGA, these are the main points, uh, to your point. The reason we don't use FPGAs today to mine Bitcoin, I mean, you can. It's just it's going to require more power, um, so it's less efficient. That's the main reason we don't do it. If you wanted to build one of these machines out of them, it's going to cost way too much money. Uh, but it's great for control boards. We have the Xilinx control board. So, Is that because you don't get the benefit of the small nanometer processes of the chip? Uh, partly, it's partly because of the way they just, the way they work when you power them on, there's more leakage current. There's more stuff in there because they're reprogrammable. Right. There's yeah. kind of some extra wasted stuff. It's and not it, It's not optimized. Yeah, the ASICs are designed for one job. And they do it great, right? Um, the, the downside to an ASIC design is once you're done with the design, that's it, so don't mess up. Um, it's a costly and timely design cycle. It takes way more engineering. Uh, but it is cheaper to build them at volume, a lot cheaper. Um, all of our cell phones have ASICs in them. Um, they require less power. That's the main thing. So they're great for hash boards uh, for those reasons. Uh, this is a view just. Some of the tools of doing FPGA design, this is actually showing you kind of the mapping, the physical placement. So all of the light blue and kind of this red and some of these lighter colors over here are the pins. This is all the logic for LuxOS's bitstream. And this is kind of a zoomed in view and how that stuff maps. And then this is the pinout. So if you look really close on this board, you can see the, the row of letters and numbers. And that maps the physical pins. It's called a BGA chipset or a ball grid array. Um, and it has this grid of pins. Um, whereas those ASIC chips, that picture I showed you, it had pins on the edges. So a little bit different pinout design. Uh, I wanted to talk about the secure hash algorithm a little bit. Uh, we'll just, this website here is great. I think we'll be able to provide slides that you can post. Yeah. 
Um, but if you guys are curious about what these ASICs are doing, what is this hashing, just go to this website. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but this number, this is how many possible outputs there are for SHA-256. Do you guys want to take any guesses where that number comes from? I mean, I know some of you know. What, what do you say? Two to the 256? Yeah, exactly. We love powers of two, two to the 256. That's it. Um, all right, firmware. <laughs> Finally got to firmware. <laughs> Zach, I might need part two, man. Um, so firmware is like, you can think of it as software that's close to the hardware. So firmware is software that runs on something like a hardware Bitcoin miner, right? It's, it's an embedded type of software. Um, so I gave you some examples here, you know, phones, TVs, cameras, computers, Bitcoin miners. They all have different firmware needs. Um, the OEM stock firmware that comes with these that Bitmain ships out is super limited. You plug it in, you set up your mining pool, and that might be about all you can do with it. And it's going to hash at the nameplate hash rate. It's going to be crazy loud because you can't underclock it. Um, and the key variables for Bitcoin miners um, that you don't get access to are voltage and frequency. So frequency is a digital signal, the, the clock of ones and zeros. And that rate, that frequency of that digital clock, that pulsating one and zero, is how the ASIC chip knows how fast to process all of those hashes. Um, so if you double your frequency, you're going to double your hash rate out of that chip. If you have it, you're going to have your hash rate. Um, so third-party firmware, that's, that's like the main thing you're unlocking. Um, so changing voltage impacts power. Changing frequency impacts power and hash rate. Um, yeah, and here's like an example of a clock. And if you doubled the frequency, those pulses would be twice as fast, or you'd have double the pulses in the same amount of time. So hopefully that idea of frequency makes, makes sense. Um, this cartoon here kind of shows you this this relationship of uh, volts, amps, and resistance. Um, there's an, an analogy to water, but I'm just going to skip that, keep moving. Uh, this is something I pulled together forever ago when I first got an XP running with Lux OS. Um, it shows you the efficiency at different profiles. Um, so I ranged it all the way down to 50 megahertz, which is a minimum frequency that ASIC chips support on Bitmain. Uh, miners all the way up to 625 megahertz. Um, and this, this here is just because the 134 terahash model had a different voltage setting. Don't worry about that, but basically you see this trend of like, wow, when it's way underclocked, it's not efficient, but we kind of hit this sweet spot right around 300 megahertz. Um, so going into the halving, if you don't have a lot of power access, but you had a lot of machines, it would be uh, you know, it would be good to run them at their optimal efficiency um, if you could power enough machines on and make them as efficient as you could, in my opinion. So, like at my house, I can plug in two S19s into 240 volt at a time um, at full hash rate, or I could plug three, maybe four in underclocked. And so I can actually get more hash rate for the same amount of power if I, if I control them right. And that's the benefit of something like Lux OS. Um, just a few pictures here of, of development and different things. Uh, LuxOS gives you, you know, full control of these variables, voltage and frequency. We have an API that you can use too, along with the GUI. Um, our one year birthday is next Friday. We released March 15th, 2023. Um, this was kind of a meme we had going around because when we initially released, uh, we only had SD cards running on Xilinx. I think BeagleBone was pretty quick after that from SD card. Um, but these are just some of the benefits of LuxOS. We have an API, which means you can write software to control the machine, um, or have a GUI that uses that API to control it. Um, a GUI is a, the user interface, right? What pulls up on your computer. Um, you can do tuning and optimization. We have an alpha release of our, our base tuner, and we're still working on tuning. Little behind some of the competition because we're we're a new product, right? We had to get the the bread and butter first, and then work on features. We have a really cool thermal management feature. Um, we can do hash rate splitting, automatic updates. You can set your miner to update, and when we do a release, it'll pull it down. 
Uh, so that makes it really easy as a user. You don't have to worry about, you know, how do I upgrade this thing? Um, advanced settings, there's all kinds of configurability. We really open it up to the user. Um, big miners would use things like dynamic load control or curtailment uh, to work with the energy companies and optimize their profits or um, allow more power into the grid, kind of acts as a battery to the grid when miners are doing stuff like that. Uh, we also have really good debug and diagnostics um, and improving as we go. Uh, you might say, well, what does this cost me? Our dev fee is 2.8%. So if you get a hash rate of a 100 terahash, uh, 2.8 terahash are going to Luxor and you keep the rest and your pool will have a fee too probably. Um, if you use Luxor's mining pool, uh, you get a discount on that as well. Um, so it's kind of a like a group discount of uh, firmware dev fee and pool fees. Yes? Would you describe the relationship between firmware developers and OEMs as adversarial or? No, firmware? no, they, you know, they don't just, we don't have data sheets, they don't want to give us information, but I think, I think they like that there's other companies developing firmware because it does make their hardware more attractive and they're really in the market to sell the hardware. So I, I think they like it personally. Yeah. Yeah, so um, most, it's pretty easy to install over the stock firmware. Um, most firmware has an easy way to uninstall. LuxOS has now made it incredibly easy to uninstall. So if you ever want to flash it on a board, uh, it's super easy to get rid of it if you don't like it. So we, we definitely don't want people to feel like, oh man, now I'm stuck with this and I don't know how to get rid of it. But I think once you put it on, you're gonna enjoy it. So, and we're always making it better, yeah. So, some do, most are outsourcing from my knowledge. I don't have a ton of knowledge, but there are some big companies that I believe have their own firmware or like white glove versions, meaning they've worked with someone, uh, but they have like different rights to it somehow. Um, so we also have this commander tool um, and that was a tool developed to support our remote installs and it's kind of grown into additional configuration and management. Um, I might have a chance to show you really quick with this machine how it works a little bit and show you the GUI. It um, has network scanning too. If you need to find your machines, it pulls them all in for you so you don't have to use that archaic uh, bitmain thing. I can't even remember what it's called. Yeah. <coughs> We, we give you the tools to be able to do it. You could write software that works with the API to come up with your own tuning algorithms. We are currently working on tuning. Right now our, our alpha tuner, you pick a frequency or a hash rate. It's the same thing, frequency equates a hash rate. And it's gonna find the optimal voltage to give you the best efficiency at that hash rate. Eventually we're gonna have tuning that will find I believe that will find the best hash rate for that machine, kind of like that chart that I showed. Um, but there's a lot of pieces that we need to improve to even have that in the discussion. Uh, we also, just like that chart that I made, we also have a lot of data for that. We have a product called Hash Rate Index. It's a website, there's a blog. Some of that info's there. We have a subscription, different subscription levels where we release some of that data. We're actually gonna push out a having report with some S21 data uh, coming soon, similar to what I just showed for XP. Um, so I was gonna show a Lux OS and Commander demo. How are we doing on time, Zach? Good, I mean, we got 20 minutes. Okay. If you wanna just skip questions, we got plenty of time. All right, let me do this. We've been doing questions as we go, so that's been really nice. Let me open Commander. All right, so this is Commander. I already scanned the network. It's really small, I apologize. I don't even know how to make it bigger right now. It's uh, I was just doing that, yeah. Um, view, zoom go. in, control plus plus, what? I don't even know what that was. Control plus plus, I don't know. Control shift plus. 
I don't know. Control shift. Oh, that's it. All right. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I did a network scan. It found the miner running there through my phone hotspot. If I click on that link, it pulls it right up in my browser. Here's the LuxOS GUI. Um, if I go back to Commander real quick, um, I can see like the profile it's running, voltage, temperatures, frequency. It's at 225 megahertz right now. I think the default frequency is like 490. I can't remember. But um, here's where you can kind of configure your networks to scan them. Um, so that's really cool. And then if you check this, if this was running Bitmain firmware, you could check this and a little install button would come up. You just install it to flash right there, all the control boards we support, so everything but CVI tech. Um, but also I can go here and configure. Um, I can reboot it. I can go into general settings. I can adjust my target temps. If I adjusted this temp to be colder, it would get the fans to spool up a little more. We could set up our ATM tool for thermal management, uh, pool configuration. Here's one place you can uninstall LuxOS. Um, the other place is if you go to the miner. I'll just kind of walk you through the GUI really if quick. If you uninstall LuxOS, how do you reinstall like, the stock firmware? Does it automatically do it? Or? Yeah, so when you uninstall LuxOS, the Bitmain firmware that was on that machine, on that control board originally, will restore itself. Okay. If you had like Brains or Vanish or a com whatever competitor, it, you would have to uninstall that first and then install. So that uninstall process would put you back to Bitmain. Um, so no matter what, you're always going to revert back to Bitmain firmware stock. But from there, you could install whatever firmware you want or keep Bitmain. So yeah. At some point, did you turn on the fans really loud? Yeah, I don't. Here, let me underclock it a little bit. Just <laughs> I, I don't want to use. I'm only drawing a hundred or a thousand watts. I didn't want to go too crazy. Um, let me go super. So I just picked super low mode. We're going to go down to 150 megahertz. Um, here's our chip health view, by the way. And it just went unhealthy because I'm ramping. Uh, but that showed you all the chips were healthy. Um, so you can kind of see if you have any, any issues. We have some improvements coming to this as well, especially on S21, T21 series machines. Um, so inside of here is where you can set up temps, ATM, and do manual fans. So. Um, you asked for it. Let's go 100% here. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Woo. It's actually in this big of a room. It doesn't sound horrible, yeah. but. How would you sound without your OS? Wait, say it again. <laughs> so if you say sound, uh, how would you uh, how would you work without looks as? Because you told that uh, original operation system does not control. Uh, yeah, that's that's what it would sound like in a warm environment plugged into 240 volts with Bitmain firmware. The fans will be on at 100%. Now, if it's really cold, they might be running like 70%, maybe lower. They're super loud, like 80 decibels, maybe maybe more. I don't know. And the decibel scales exponential, just like the Bit uh, Bitcoin price, price. chart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we also have, like, here's where you can do pool config. This is where you can do hash rate split. So you can actually, with this, you can decide to solo mine a portion, say 5%. You could mine 10% to a charity. You could send some to bit devs. Um, maybe, I'll talk, maybe I'll talk to you about that, Zach, and send you some hash rate when I'm running these for work. We've got a pool set up. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I was about to look that out. But the best way. <laughs> The best way to actually make sure you're going to get Bitcoin uh, for your hash rate is to mine through a FPPS type pool like Luxor. Um, otherwise, if you're mining with this, uh, doing solo mining, trying to find a block, you're just wasting power. I mean, you might get lucky, but. Could you give a quick <laughs> overview of what the different pool payout structures are, like what FPPS is versus the other types? Uh, so FPPS is fixed price per share. Every miner gets an equal share for uh, what they contribute to the pool. So, so they're going to get paid for their contribution, and it's like flat. That's my understanding of it. Dan, jump in if you want. Um, PPLNS, I think, is this model where it's, 
it's like the amount of hatch rate you had, and if the pool is getting lucky, you'll get more of a payout. If they're getting unlucky, meaning they're not finding as many blocks, your payout will decrease. But so with that one, the miner is taking the risk of the luck, but with the FPPS, the pool is taking the luck. Risk. I think that's a good way to think so about it, yeah. The pool benefits if there's a lucky streak, not the end user. Yes. With the PPLNS, the end but, user benefits, not the pool. But in a way, some of that's shared too, I that's think. Right. I don't know the exact details. I mean, we take, a pool fee, right. and I think if we're getting luck, well, I don't know how that works. It's based on hash the, price. The so. FPPS is like if you plug in for just an hour a day, that that's a better pool payout, right? Because you, yeah. if you don't find the block within that time, you're still going to get paid. You're going to get paid for the shares you submitted to the pool. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be really small for an hour, but. All right, so that's that's kind of the demo. Oh, in advanced settings, here's another place you can uninstall. So I just want to, you know, if you're playing around with firmware. I, I think some people have this fear like, oh, this is going to break my machine. It's generally pretty safe to install and uninstall different firmware. Um, and it's fun to play with them and, and see what's out there. So I hope those of you who do mine, I hope you all try LuxOS sometime. Yeah, back there. Uh, since it's a demo, how much have you mined during this presentation? I'd have to log into my pool account, but it's, okay. it's almost nothing. It's ridiculous. I mean, we're talking uh, cents worth of Bitcoin, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Forty terahash or something like that. Forty-two. Uh, yeah, it was doing uh, forty-two terahash. Yeah. Oh. Now it's not because I underclocked it more. It's down to about thirty-one, but it was doing forty-two point seven. I think. I'm not good at like the financial math numbers off the top of my head. Yeah. So just dawned on me that you're. David Erlocker of the Erlocker Loki kit? Yeah, yeah, so that's what that is. That is the Erlocker kit. Yeah, so, um. so does the Loki kit, are you not utilizing two boards? Are you, are you using all three boards very low? Yeah, yeah, so this is a K-Pro. So the reason this is named after me is, to my knowledge and based on what I put on Twitter, I was the very first person. I think I might have been the first person to do two hash boards with a Loki. That was on a different machine, but when I got the XP, I knew, or not the XP, the K-Pro, I knew based on uh, chip count and the fact they ran at low voltages that it was ideal for a Loki in a three hash board config. Um, so I, this is my Bitcoin mining at home portion. Uh, these are pros and cons. Um, we'll kind of skip that and get to the pictures. Um, or do we have time? Like, I don't know if we have time. We've got 15. Okay, okay. Is this the Zach Bombstead thing you're talking about? Yeah. So let me give you guys the rundown on home mining, okay? So pros, you're consistently acquiring Bitcoin over time, so dollar cost averaging, right? Now, you can just dollar cost average if you want, but mining is also cool because you're like part of the network, decentralization, learning opportunity, um, all that kind of cool stuff. Um, and then heat is a pro. Uh, just like here, we can use that as a space heater. I have this thing running by my desk, and on cold days, it's like a little foot warmer. It's super nice. Um, you can do whole house heat if you're running, you know, if you've got the right infrastructure, which I'm going to show you hopefully in a minute. Um, can heat your garage or shop. My garage has been well heated with Luxor owned Bitcoin miners. You can use that as a dryer when I go skiing. I have a little like outlet coming from this quiet box I've got that I'll show you. Um, and I just put like my boots there, my gloves. It's really sweet. Uh, people have made clothes dryers with these. You can heat water. There's people like heating pools. Hot tubs are supplementing heat. Um, that takes a little more ingenuity to convert this air heat to liquid heat. But if you have an immersion or uh, liquid cooled miner, you have that transfer already kind of set up. Um, some cons are noise, obviously, but if you can underclock, the noise isn't too bad, honestly. Um, heat is also a con, just like it's a pro, because in the summer, heat isn't great. Um, it dries out the air, so I've been trying to heat my house with Bitcoin, and my family hates it, because it dries the house out. And I have a humidifier, and even with the humidifier, like the whole house humidifier, all that dry air, because it's already Colorado dry, but then you're heating all that air up, and drying it even more. Um, so I'm actually currently trying to figure out how can I add more water <laughs> to this heat input. Um, electricity costs, you know, that's 
it's not fun to get the electric bill, but then you look at your Bitcoin wallet and you're like, all right, I'm okay. Um, <laughs> especially this last week. Um, and then also like there's, there's safety hazards, right? Fire hazards, these things have been known to light on fire. Um, personally, if you're underclocking, I think you're, you're very safe in general, but you still have to pay attention to your own home's electrical infrastructure, your, um, you know, the, the ampacity or amp capacity of your wiring, your circuit breakers, all those things. Um, and that's one reason I want to keep this under 1,000 watts, because I don't have any idea about this place's electric infrastructure, but I know that's a pretty safe value uh, for continuous operation for the amount of time that we're going to be here. Um, so yeah, safety and an ec economic justification are some of other considerations uh, to think about. Okay, so what if you don't have a 240 volt circuit or don't want to deal with that or you don't want a miner running as loud as I just showed you and it's, trust me, in a big room, that wasn't bad. If you hear that running inside your house that loud it, or in your garage, it's kind of nuts, especially over time. Um, yeah? What is the best for this machine? Uh, I think you can get one through Altair Tech. This, these guys here, they're in Missouri. I think you can buy it with the Loki kit and the Erlocker kit uh, roughly for like 22, 2300. Yep. Yep. Um, so, so what? What's that? You could, you could DIY with like a J Pro for 700 bucks. Yeah, totally. Just, yeah. Can you 3D print the chassis yourself or is that? Um, you can, or you can come up with your own design, or there's tons of designs out there. Um, yeah, I understand. So for me, what's, uh, if we almost do not use it, we use it just like a home heater. Yeah. It's too expensive to be uh, to use it just as a home heater. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it depends. It depends on your perspective. There's considerations to make. Um, so yeah, if, if you want to run from 120, you can have an S9, super inefficient, especially with the having coming up. Uh, but if you need the heat, maybe it's cool. Um, but here's the Loki kit. So I also brought a Loki kit if anyone wants to come up and look at it. Um, but all you need to run, so all this one has is this little board right here and one wire. And I, I can pop the cap off of that um, if anyone wants to see it and see the Loki board. But in this picture, can see the Loki board. So this board just spoofs a power supply. The firmware thinks it's talking to a power supply. And you might say, well, why don't you guys just put that in LuxOS and who needs a Loki board? Well, it's actually nice for someone to physically know they're doing this. So from a safety perspective, plus Zach Bomsta, the guy that designed this and is the reason the Erlocker exists, um, is a great guy. And we would never want to like pull that out from under him. But really, this is a cool thing about Zach. So um, there's also this APW12 modification. So the APW12 is a native power supply that came out on all the S19 models. And there's different versions. But they have this low voltage detection brownout circuit, which is why they can't run from 240. And that's the only reason. Zach, he's also an electrical engineer. He figured out how to bypass that by soldering on two resistors. And there's there's uh, directions here. If you're tech savvy and follow safety precautions, because working on power supplies is dangerous, especially these high voltage ones, um, you can pull that off. And then you don't need a Loki anymore. And you have the advantage of the flexible voltages that that can output. Now, you do still have to respect the power infrastructure of your home. If you're running off of 120 volts, you can't run these at full hash rate. You still have to underclock. A uh, general rule of thumb is derate by 80%. Um, so if you're on a, a 15 amp circuit or a 20 amp circuit, depending what else is on that circuit, you can run the numbers and figure out where to be. But I, I personally at home don't like running it more than 1,000 watts on any outlet in my home continuously, meaning 12 plus hours. Uh, Ian? I think it does. Um, I, I think you know it's good for this system to not be running at its maximum, like all of its maximum operating points, maximum temps, all that stuff. Um, I think it does contribute to longevity personally, and I think it contributes to lowering your chances of uh, just burning one out, basically. 
having something go wrong. Uh, yeah, Hunter. Uh, so those bus bars look like they're unprotected? Are yes. Those, are those like electrically live? They are, so they are unprotected, they're live, but it's DC voltage, it's high current, low voltage, it's not a direct shock hazard, but what always worries me is the short hazard. If you dropped even a paper clip across there, you're gonna have some fireworks, because you're gonna have potentially 200 amps go through that paper clip. Um, so I, that's why I brought it covered and safe, and if I take the cover off, I always power it off first because when you take that little metal cap off, there's a chance you could touch the touch this and that everything's grounded on the chassis. Um, so definitely a chance of shorting stuff out and seeing sparks. I've actually seen it happen once in my garage and that will be the last time. So uh, great question though. Safety is a big thing with home mining, safety first. This is actually a picture of when I very first got the, the or locker configuration with all three hash boards. You can see my crazy power supply setup here. Um, and then this is what Altair came up with. It was around Thanksgiving time. He contacted me on Twitter, uh, DM or whatever, and pitched the idea of naming it after me. And I just made the request that he'd ship them with Lux OS. Um, and I didn't ask for it, but he shipped me that kit for free. I had the miner, of course, it's Luxers, but. <laughs> Anyway, um, so yeah, oh, go ahead, David. How did you design the PCB? How did he design it? How did you design it? Oh, so this PCB is designed by a guy named Zach Bomsta, and he owns Pivotal Plebtech. Um, and literally, I was just, I was actually, I think, the first person to use the Loki with the K Pro as well. I got one really early. Um, and so I was actually using it kind of to test and benefit as well, because I was giving him details like, hey, your board works with K-Pro, just like we expected, yada, yada, yada. Um, but yeah, Zach did all this design and sells these. So that config is not possible without Zach. And he's like a huge person in this home mining space and this mission of enabling people to mine using 120 volts AC um, instead of 240. Um, and he's in the Salt Lake area. Uh, and just a great guy. Um, find him on Twitter. He's he's a great guy. He gets discounts if you pay in Bitcoin. Oh yeah. Yep. True. So another thing to think about is noise. Uh, Zach also has this. I don't know if I'm saying this right, but a Nord board. It hooks into the the fans here, and then it has a USB output that interfaces with AC Infinity and maybe some other third-party fans. Um, and then if you're using one of these bigger fans. Kind of the idea is you can get, if it has enough CFM or let airflow, um, and it's a bigger diameter, it's going to be quieter. And you can kind of bypass those fans, but you have to do it in a smart way. But especially if you're underclocking, you'll be able to get sufficient airflow, and then it's going to be even quieter probably than this setup here with the stock fans. You can also buy a noise dampening quiet box. They're crazy expensive. Um, this is the one I have in my garage, which Luxor also owns. Um, but yeah, you can also get earplugs. You can hide it in your neighbor's garage and plug it in there. So I'm, I'm sure they'd appreciate that. <laughs> um, all right, I'm wrapping up here. So this was my kind of my delve into home heating. And this is a hole I put into my garage wall to get into my return air duct, and then the kind of the duct, adap duct adapter I put on uh, to, wire, to hook my heat into that. Um, but yeah, if you have like a good 240 volt circuit and you can run a couple miners, that's quite a bit of heat. You're talking, you know, 6,000 plus watts. Um, so I was able, my last month's gas bill went down by over $100 and was offset by that electric cost and the Bitcoin I mined. Uh, which was really cool to see. And then the family complained about how dry it was. So, <laughs> um, Also, there's this, this guy in Wyoming making thermo hashes stats, uh, basically a thermostat to control the machine to adjust temperatures, just another cool option. Um, here's, here's my setups. I've got miners in the quiet box with this duct going across the garage. And it's, it's changed a little bit, but that's, 
I've got an AC Infinity fan uh, down here just to get an extra boost, and then I just run the, the furnace fan constantly, so it's always pulling warm air into the home. Um, and then these are some other like Bitcoin mining at home things that people sell and that are out there in the marketplace. Uh, a lot of really cool options. Bitax is like a lotto miner, super quiet. It's just got a single ASIC chip on it. Um, really a lotto solo pool miner. You don't want to mine with a pool. It's like nothing. Um, there's all kinds of pictures online of stuff like this where people are piping heat to their house. I can't remember the name of this one, uh, but some guy making a solar hash bus is working on this. Oh, Stealth Miner, super quiet. This is a bit chimney, also made by Eltertech. Um, and this mine for heat thing is like a um, like a chassis for one hashboard. So what you were talking about, like a J Pro, can put one hashboard in there. You can run with the Loki. You can run one, two, or three hashboards depending on the machine. But there's a lot of setups where you can just do one hashboard. Cool little heater. It's gonna be nice and quiet and efficient. Um, but yeah. Questions, I guess, just talk to me afterward if we don't have time. We've asked a ton throughout, so thank you guys for the uh, interactive presentation. I've got my contact info if you want to connect with me. The Bitcoin's hopefully easy to remember now that you all know hexadecimal. <laughs> thank you, dude. Thanks, Zach. Thank you all. Also, don't forget to take shirts. Anything that's left, though, is coming back for the having party. And then there's the hoodies, too, but they're all small. So if you have kids or no small people or you're small, just take some, because we need to get rid of them. So um, yes, back there. Yeah. LuxOS, no. So <laughs> that's a common question. What's miners are hard to crack. Uh, we've been focusing, since we've only been out for a year, we've focused on kind of the easier targets, low-hanging fruit, which is Bitmain, and they have a huge market share. Uh, so it just makes sense. I think someday maybe we'll support what's minor if Luxor wants to keep pushing firmware. Uh, but Bitmain also is releasing miners faster than we can keep up with. I have two other machines coming to my house probably by next week um, that we're adding support for, and it, it's like just never ending. Uh, we're working, working hard, fast, trying to improve it. Try it out. Good question. Yeah. Do you plan to develop any of your own uh, control boards? No, there are companies doing that. Um, honestly, like early in the early days with SD card swaps, we did some installs where we swapped out AmLogic boards that we didn't support yet. And if you're thinking about a big mining facility. It's just not practical. The control boards are cool for home miners, small scale miners, if they want to go that route. Epic's control board looks interesting. Brains came out with one. I don't know why these people aren't putting Wi-Fi embedded on the board. If, if Luxor did a control board, I promise you it would have Wi-Fi built in, but we're not going to do that. We just There's better, better things to focus our time on. I, the control board model is interesting to me. I don't really see how it's paying off for them, but hopefully it is. So, yep. So you mentioned that you're, you're kind of gnawing on the, the, the initial problems that you can solve first when it comes to firmware, and then you'll get into the, the really gnarly stuff, which is like the auto-tuning side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and we're already stepping into that auto-tuning realm, so that's the, pretty deep into it. Well, could you explain to folks kind of how, how big of a, an elephant that is to eat? Because that's a very different like process of doing that versus like, what you've done already, which is beautiful. And Thank you. You've done so much in like a year is kind of insane. Yeah. Uh, so and I'm, I'm curious how you can articulate like the problem of auto tuning because that's the point where you can actually start blowing people's stuff up. Yeah. So, and just to to put some extra into that, we were developing a whole year, more than a year before we even released anything to the public, um, and we had it working half a year before that on select machines, right? Uh, but one cool thing about our firmware is the software component of it is Rust. It's Rust code, and it's entirely our code base. Um, so because we have that ownership and we're not trying to hack into something that already exists, uh, it's kind of like this beautiful, clean slate. 
Uh, but there, it is, you know, decent sized dev team. There's a lot of hands in there. You know, there's bugs that come up. There's other things that other fires we put out, things to support. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, the whole idea of auto tuning. When you think of like, I just want to develop an API and be able to send commands to the chips and stuff. It's pretty straightforward. But auto tuning now, you're almost bringing in like this idea of like big data and AI and this model of all these variables, because there's temperature variables, there's voltage, there's frequency, uh, there's fans. Fans are tied to temperature. You can't control the outside ambient temperature. Um, so when you think of tuning and how it's this multivariable system, uh, it's very complicated. Like It's not easy to just write code to tune one of these complex machines with hundreds of chips. right? Um, so I don't know how else to say it. And honestly, there's we, we have people on the team that are way better at Rust than I am. And they're the people currently working on the tuner. So I'm not the most knowledgeable person on what it's even taken to get what we have now. But we've been working on it for quite some time already uh, to get our voltage tuning, which is going to optimize voltage at a given hash rate. But great question. Did I answer it kind of? Yeah, just from. Like I'm, I'm really impressed by how much you guys have been able to do in such a short amount of time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and a lot of like the incumbents and the folks in the space, I think like firmware is one of those things that is like easy to not appreciate enough because from a consumer standpoint, like as a miner, you're kind of crow magnet. Like plug it in, does it run? If it's not, yeah. Running, whose fault is it? Um, but the idea that like you have to voltage tune a hundred and some odd chips per board and then make it responsive to ambient conditions and make it not blow itself up and be stable and have all the internal fail safes on something that you didn't build. Yeah. Um, and we don't have data sheets for. And there's no data sheets. <laughs> and every different manufacturer is writing it with a different code base. Yep. And their component structures are all different. Um, so it's insane. It's kind of like, it's kind of bonkers, actually. Like, it. When I sit back and think about all the work we've done and what it's taken, it, it is kind of bonkers. We have some incredibly smart people at Luxor working on this stuff. Not not me. Like the team is amazing. So, but yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, okay, there's Sam, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, it's that Xilinx for control board. So you said it's running Linux. Is there like an ARM processor on there, or do you simulate a CPU and run the OS? On yeah. So on Xilinx, it has a Zinc embedded FPGA. It is an ARM-based processor, and it actually runs a. Xilinx supports a few different Linux OSs. It runs something called Petalinux. Um, but yeah. And that's kind of built into the Xilinx dev tools as well at that low layer. All right, I think we're good. Cool. Thank you, David. Thanks, guys.